Earlier, I was telling Natalie and Shannon that, uh, and Chris that a thunderstorm is moving through, and it just like started rattling everything outside. So hopefully, the power won't go out or anything. And um, El Paso is kind. Of, if you're familiar with El Paso, it's kind of like um, Lancaster, Palmdale area for for the environment. So it's a desert kind of environment uh, instead of a Mediterranean where I'm at. And also, there's a couple of people on here from our contractors. Um, Alex and David, hello, that are joining us, uh, who were instrumental in a lot of the work that was recently completed out there. So what I'm gonna talk about um, is just the Tijuana River Valley, the International Border and Intermittent Archaeology. So I'm gonna go ahead and see if this is gonna work. There we go. So um, first I always, um, ask people if they've ever heard of the International Boundary and Water Commission. Yes. Okay, because <laughs> a lot of people haven't. And uh, it, it's quite interesting that when I talk to people like, who are you guys? And they have no idea. We're um, under the US State Department. So I'm a US State Department employee because we can go across the border. But also, uh, just uh, I was given a disclaimer, the speech is uh, my opinion, not that the US IBWC or the US State Department, it's solely my opinion, so I cover my rear in case of anything. Um, so that's where we are. And um, so I'm just gonna go through some stuff on here. I've got about an hour, I've got around 90 slides, so hopefully I can entertain you enough with some of this. Uh, the beginning of the commission from uh, the Mexican-American War of 1846-1848, we were um, actually, founded after that war. And then we had the making of the permanent border monuments, one uh, number 258 in San Diego there. Uh, treaties and minutes, so it's because we work directly with Mexico on issues across the border, that's why we're under the State Department. And then also some of the stuff in the Barlow Blanco Treaty of 1889, which actually made a lot of the monuments permanent structures from what they were from before. So um, a lot of people don't, understand there's a lot of issues involved with, with what I do. And as you can see here on the treaties we have with the U.S., of course, everybody knows about the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848, which ended the war. And then the later Gadsden Purchase, which um, added a lot of southern Arizona and New Mexico to the border, and it changed it. So I'm going to let you read some of this. I'm just talking about a few of it. I'll try not to read too much. And then um, with the Convention of 1882, that made us uh, another temporary agency, but also gave us time to resurvey the, and add additional monuments along the border, uh, all the way to here and um, just across the river in New Mexico. And the Barlow Blanco surveys were part of that from 1891 to 1894. And the Convention of 1884 actually gave us, uh, changed on how the rivers would meander with. Um, new conventions for the Rio Grande and Colorado. And then 1889 established the International Boundary Commission as a permanent commission. As you saw in our banner up there, it says 1889. That's when we actually were uh, made into a permanent commission. And then you have the, the Banco Convention in 1905, which basically when the river would migrate, this, it would change. And so what the Banco Convention just did was said this land, here's the border, this land is Mexico, this land is the U.S., and kind of helped straighten things out. And then in 1906, we had another treaty with equitable distribution, and that actually worked with uh, in the El Paso River Valley here down to Old Fort Quitman, Texas, which no longer exists. It was one of the roads that was, or the forts that was established after the treaty to keep the, because the Apaches were uh, crossing the border a lot of times and raiding to Mexico. And then during the New Deal time frame, which we had a lot of projects, most of the majority of the IBWC projects were made during that time. And one is the rectification project, which went from El Paso to American Dam all the way to Fort Quitman or Little Box Canyon, about 115 miles, and actually rectified the river and made it straight. And then neither country would lose land, so they, they traded. And then we also had canalization, which went from Cabajo Dam up here in New Mexico down to American Dam at the border in the Nexus where the U.S. and Mexico and New Mexico meet. So if you ever come out here, get in touch with me, you know, take you down to the monument so you can actually stand like right there in that area if the river's not flooding. 
So it's a pretty interesting area. And then in 1944 is where we changed into the International Boundary and Water Commission. And that, is, that gave us more room to do a lot more work, especially on sanitation issues along the border. So um, different aspects of it, as you saw on here, we have what's called minutes, the treaties and minutes. And I just put this in here, um, as you can read it, what it just basically says is it allows us not to have to go through our respective Congresses for both um, the US and Mexico. We can actually have our commissioners work out a program to take care of this with each other and have to and bypass a lot of the stuff where you have the Senate and Congress so we can actually get work done. And it works really well for us to work on this stuff, especially like in San Diego where we're having the stuff going on with, with uh, Tijuana, and us along the, you know, the sewage they have there and even in other places along the border where we have stuff and when the river migrates over time due to floods. So what this was just saying on here is just a, exactly what a minute is. And if you go to our webpage, um, ibwc.gov, as we're a government agency, you can actually read about a lot of this information in the history of the organization and what new things are going on um, with that. In fact, a lot of the water that comes down the Colorado river that goes to san diego and la and stuff we help we under we take care of a lot of that under our compacts with them so the first minute was in 1922 but it was just a thing for credentials because at that time frame things were kind of slow with mexico because they were just coming out of the mexican revolution in that time frame and so then they were establishing the minutes to start to work together with mexico on this and then also, the monument minutes, which I'll be talking about, as you can see, 230, 244, 249, and 271, these deal with the various aspects of them that will be completed and the maintenance of the monuments. And that 244, as you can see in the bottom here from our webpage, that was in 1973 that was established. And that basically told who would take care of the monuments. And under this, Mexico takes care of the monuments along the Call, uh, the California border out there. Now also, if you look at this picture, this is on Ote Mesa. This is Monument 252. And you notice all the rocks around that? Just remember the rocks, okay? Now, if you, you look at that, you go out there today, it doesn't look anything like that at all, of course. Yeah, I can see Mary's like shaking her head like, yeah, nothing even close to that. So it's completely changed to what it looks like nowadays, as you know about the border. So here's a map, and um, as you can see, out on the left side, you have the Tijuana Sanitation, River Flood Control. As you go to the right, you're going to see all the different projects we have. In Nogales, we actually have another wastewater treatment plant that comes from Mexico where we treat that sewage like we do in the Tijuana plant. Uh, the one in uh, the Colorado River is the Treaty of 44 for deliveries. You get over here to where El Paso is at, you can see what we have there. And then just to the, you can see Cabajo Dam and where we have canalization project. I know it's really tough to see this on um, a computer screen. That's why I use a big one when I'm doing stuff, but I have to have it with the camera. But if you go down, you're going to see where we have the, the Chamazal project and then rectification, which actually straighten out the river. And as you go down, uh, you get near Presidio, Texas. We've been doing a lot of work down there recently. And then up over from Big Bend, you have Amistad Dam, which was put in the 1960s and just recently became a National Register nomin nominatable for that. And then all the various projects going down in Falcon Reservoir, which we have Falcon Dam, which was put in the 1950s. And I have over 800 and some archaeological sites there. And, um, and I got a fly, I got a mosquito flying around here, so I might try to get him. But um, so we have that down there. Then you get down to the lower Rio Grande Valley where we have uh, an area that's booming to up to 10 million people sometime in the near future. And we, we do all the flood control that comes down that area because of all the different storms, hurricanes and stuff, we have to be able to maintain our levees down that area. And then way down there by Matamoros is where Fort Brown is at, which is also part of ours. And that's uh, where the, Mexican-American War started when the USI put a fort in there and that's where it started at and actually is still in existence what's left of the breastworks and we have that as part of our um, land holdings down there in the future hopefully be 
losing that to the National Park Service. Uh, because if you look at this whole area that you see here, um, I have a huge staff that helps me to manage all this. And that's me. I am the only one that manages all this stuff. And with budgets and stuff, it's a lot of fun trying to make sure you can do what you can. That's why a lot of our stuff we contract out because it's just me. Now, here's something that I put in here. Um, this is actually one of the border maps that I need to write about is, this is the copper plates. This is one of them, but the one from the El Paso area we actually have here. These were plates made in the 1850s and 1890s in Washington. And they were made by the Emory Commission to um, talk about, well, to show what the border was. And we found them in our warehouse. And just think Raiders of the Lost Ark. I mean, we found them in a box like that stored in the warehouse. And that's why it's interesting because this is California on your left side, the Pacific Ocean over there. And as you can see on this one for the California one, this is from the 18, I believe the 1890s. Um, this is based off, this is map number one from the 1850s. And so this is, uh, we don't know exactly what happened, but I think they were mistakes or something. And we got them back in the 1970s. And now they're at the National Archives, except for one week we have here. So these are quite interesting because they actually show all the landmarks and stuff that are gone nowadays. Now I'm going to go into talking about the monuments. Um, in San Diego, if you've been down to um, Borderfield State Park and you look through the fence, you notice you'll see the monument over there across the river. And we have a lot of these monuments all along here. Well, number one starts here in El Paso. Originally it was in San Diego, then they moved the commission out here and they established it here. And then it went west. So 258 ended in San Diego, but we have 276 because we added the little ones over time. As you can see here, Monument One, you come out here. Um, this is 1911, about the Mexican Revolution, and the people down there by this little building where you can see them all gathered, that's Ponce, Pancho Villa, Madero, and all of them having their meeting at that time frame back in 1911 as they were calling in for the Battle of Juarez. So there was actually people on the hill shooting into um, the Federales in Pancho Villa and his group were also fighting there and ordering stuff because there was a telephone there. And if things went bad, as you can see with the monument is, that's the, the US border. So they could just run across the border and be safe. Well, here's what it looks like just not too many years ago. Uh, where the trees are at is actually where the original building was. And the one you see to the right is a recreation. It's called the Casa de Adobe Museum. And actually it's a recreation of that old one from that time frame. And to the north of there is a, is a brickyard where they manufacture brick. And then you see on the right, American Dam, which is a New Deal project from the 1930s. And that was used for under our water treaties for the American irrigators for the water that came down the river. So what you're looking at is um, back in the 1850s under the Emory time frame, when they made the border, they just used local whatever they could find. And as you can see here, it was a rock stack. And that's what a lot of them were, were rock stacks. And each one they numbered for when they went down the line, they were using um, compass and um, various instruments to um, figure out where they were at on the ground by, in, by the night. I forgot the name, but uh, you know what I'm saying. And then here's monument number one. As you can see, it's changed. There's no gate around it anymore. And there's actually, it's uh, concrete over and it's painted and New Me uh, Mexico takes care of this monument. So if you're out here in El Paso, as you can read on, on the right side, they were all established line of sight. So if you ever get over there to Monument 258 and you look straight east, you'll see Monument 257 up on the hill on Spooner's Mesa. And that's 257. So you'll see it up there because they're all made with line of sight. And then also on some of the monuments, you'll see handles on the side. Well, that's so they could put a big flag in there so they could see it from a distance with the flag so they could figure out where they were at. And so on this one, Monument One, looking across the river, you can see Monument Two up there. So we have specifications for all of the monuments that um, if we put any more monuments in. And they have a concrete base, as you can see here. 
and they're either made of steel or concrete or stone, quarried stone. And on this one, as you can see from 19, I believe that's 1955, that shows exactly what they have to have. And then you have to have a plate on both sides, one in Spanish, one in English. And basically when you're there, the border is from the tip of the monument down to the base. That's the border, kind of just a line. And so here's what Monument One looked like back in the 1890s. As you can see, it was um, quarried stone. Let me go back. Quarried stone, and you're looking off to the east. And then Monument 121 uh, in Ogales, you really can't see that too much. All right. Um, but if you look down that line, you see a building going across the border. It's kind of hard to point out, but you see that open space and that uh, building and the 1907 Roosevelt Doctrine says you can't have any buildings along within 50 feet of the border because of smuggling they were having. So that was changed and the computer keeps wanting to change the picture, so, sorry about that. But um, they put in all these different monuments in the 1890s in the Barlow Blanco survey. And you see this one here, uh, just east of Yuma, Arizona, and it's number 185, it's on a, a mountaintop that's pretty hard to get up to. And you can see at that time frame, the original Emory Monument is that rock pile where the guy has the flag. So that's where the original boundary marker was set. And then in the 1890s, when the Barlow, uh, Barlow Blanco surveys, they came out and they put the new monuments in there and they hauled all this up with a uh, horse and mule and they were camping out there. And I'll show you a picture of that in a little bit. So let's go to California, which we're interested in. So west of Calexico, if you've been in and out that area, as you can see here, they're really um, just a monument, 221 out the middle of nowhere. And that's what it looks like just a few years ago. Now the walls changed also because they've put in different walls, the new boulder walls they put in. But this is uh, basically the walls on the behind them are all on the US side. So as you can see on this one, this is Monument 244, um, south of Portrero, and I'll point that out, it's actually by Tecate. Um, if you see the rocks that are in this picture from the 1890s, that was the original monument. So they just knocked them over. And then they built them or else they put the monument in a different spot, not too far away as you saw in the previous one. And that's what it looks like today, as you can see. Um, still looks the same uh, with the base and the steel monument attached to it. So, 258. Um, if you've been out there to Borderfield State Park, it looks completely different now, right? If you've been out there, I can't see everybody nodding their heads, but I know if you've been out there, the gate's gone and um, no more horse and buggy. And it looks complete, and it's grown up on that area, except to the north a little bit where you have the estuary. So this is what one of the, the original monument looked like. It was marble. It was hauled around the, the cape, the, the horn, and brought up and uh, put in that area. But what was happening, um, people were keeping up, uh, taking piece, pieces of it for souvenirs. So if you look at the capital on this, you see part of it's gone because people were climbing up there and taking chunks off it. And because of that, we had to actually replace it. Um, by the 1890s that it was so mutilated, they basically had to replace it and protect it with an enclosure with a fence. And then uh, by 74, the marble monument that was reconstructed in 1894 still stood at its original site. So and this is from, uh, if you go to Wikipedia, you can find some interesting information on this. But as you can see from the initial be, uh, point of boundary between the U.S. and Mexico by the Joint Commission, that's what it was called back then, um, they agreed to take care of this in that area. And if you look at this picture from the 1890s in the Barlow Blanco survey, you can see a dog down there on the right side of it. So they had actually had a dog with them out there. And then there's a couple of signs on both sides of the monument that you can't quite read them, but you can see them there. So this is what it looks like today, Monument 258. Now it is changed again. 
because there's another fence that replaced the one that's right there that went up to the monument because Mexico says you can't have this on our border. So they moved it back uh, um, at that in, in 2010. And of course, this is known as the Friendship Monument, the Friendship Circle area. And where I'm standing, uh, where this picture is, there's another fence there now. So if you go out there and you look, um, this is what it was looking like at that time frame. And when I'm out there, a lot of times I'll go up to this and the U.S. side looks exactly the same. But on the Mexican side in Spanish, the tour guides and stuff have taken charcoal and actually filled that in so you can actually read that a little bit better of what it says because it's um, faded out over the years. And the boundary of the U.S. as it says on here. So in 2011, they put a new wall in and they did this construction. As you can see on this monument, it had a um, brick base concrete on top and then the monument itself, but they didn't go into this because there actually is some artifacts in there. And so they cleared this away before the commission, otherwise it'd been out there to monitor it because archeologically you're, you're looking at uh, National Register, which is on the National Register um, monument. And uh, we've actually published some stuff on the Society for California Archeology span on the monument and other monuments along the border, you can read if you're interested in SCA proceedings from 2014. So you can see they put a trench in and then they put that fence in, that bollard monument or that bollard fence. And then there's another fence just now where I'm standing in that picture. Now, as I was talking about on the monuments, as you can see here, um, just did another publication, just came out in Kiva talking about smelter town here in el paso and the border monuments in new mexico and arizona and what you see is um a lot of them when they put them in in the 1850s they designated them in roman numerals and some of these are been replaced but they've been misidentified the rock piles and that's what the article is dealing with is they think that they're graves, but they're not. They're actually just been pushed over. And um, at 257, another archaeologist I was talking to out there thought that it was a grave, that the guy died while he was put the monuments, so they just buried him there. It's like, no, that's the Emory monuments. Those are the original monuments, kind of like a survey um, monument, but they're the original ones put in the 1850s. And people don't realize that this rock that you can see in this camp photo here when they were putting Monument 66 in, they just pushed it over and scattered everything, but that's what it is. These are the original monuments, and when these areas I go out to, as you can see, at that time frame when they were doing this, they left all their trash out there. So you'll, I had surveyors come out and tell me they've been finding um, old paint cans and other stuff in the 1930s and before of all these artifacts. So, here is Monument 257, what I was just talking about. As you can see here, all the rocks in front, that's where part of the monument, of the original Emory Monument in the 1890s. And look at that view looking out over the ocean in the Bay Area out there, just pristine from just over 100 years ago. Not, nobody out there. So you look at it today, Monument 257, there's still some rocks out there and stuff, but you have the um, matting of the wall here, and now you have another wall that's replaced it. But you can see as you're looking off towards the west here, you can see um, the tower over in Tijuana just to the south of where Monument 258 is. And so they just put these in line of sight, as I said from before, and um, under minute 244 from 73, it's up to Mexico to take care of these. And a lot of the monuments have access points right in the walls that we can get to. So Monument 255, if you go down there by the port of entry, this monument was down there. And you can see in the background, it's completely different now. And that's where the pedestrian bridge is at. So if you walk over in that area, you see that. Now, interesting thing about this photo is um, not only is it right there um, near the Tijuana River, but this little person that's standing there, he looks like a hobbit. He's got these really huge feet, and I think they drew him in this picture to make it look like somebody there. So I, I find it quite interesting just to see this. And remember that fence 
they had that under two, 255 at a fence, like number one, and then 258. So that fence was there. But in the 1970s, we took it down because the original monument was replaced because the first one washed away in a flood around 1891. So here's a picture of us removing this fence. And um, I've been trying to find out over time whatever happened with these fences. What did they do with them? Did they um, somebody haul them away and get them for scrap or are they just put in somewhere else? Because it's, it's um, historic, a historic uh, architectural feature. So as you can see here, monument 255, as they're tearing the fence down, and then you have the chain link fence around it that was right there that they had. And then here's what it looks like today. And so it's actually behind the border, of course, they're all, they all are behind the border fence there uh, from 2012, this picture was, and we GPS them uh, every couple of years anyway. But what happened was uh, the monument 255, the center of it was found um, in a flood because it washed away in 1891 in the flood. And what happened was um, a guy over in the Mexican side was doing some backhoe trenching and he hit this with his backhoe and dug it up from about 10 feet, 15 feet deep. So this was then brought over and it wasn't gonna go back to replace the original one because we already replaced it but it just was there by the pedestrian bridge. So when you walk over there, you'll see this. And, and now you know what the story is behind that. So if you're ever out there. So here's um, something I wanted to say is a lot of the um, monuments, um, when people from different agencies go out there and record this, they don't realize that the monuments are Department of State property. And if you think about it, down the center of it, is the border. So these things are owned jointly by the US and Mexico. And so you have maybe BOM land that comes up to it, then you have a little square around it, which is the monument, which is our property. And so um, people don't realize it. And then you'll find the rocks from the original Emory monuments on some of these monuments. And that also um, needs to be recorded. So people haven't recorded that because they didn't know. So Let's look at this here. Here's from that um, one, another map from uh, the 1880s. Uh, this is the report of the Boundary Commission. And it shows all the different mountain ranges along the border. And it also on this map has a delineation of where the, the monuments are at. And then recently, or in modern times, we have this one as you can see from 2008, when my boss was in charge of the GIS program, on this map, the monuments in California are all plotted here. Now, if you go over to the very right side, you see by Yuma, one of the monuments there, 209, actually was placed in the Colorado River and it washed away. So it's never been found. So then they moved it and put it on the hillside uh, in California. And um, interesting stories on that, uh, before the dams went in, on the on the Colorado, there's actually pictures I have in the 19 about 1912, and you see a riverboat going up the river, and they're dropping off um, riprap because the river was flooding at that time, and that was all before the dam was put in up there by Las Vegas. So here's something here, and you can see this. Uh, lots of books have been published on this in the monuments. As you can see here on your right side is Monument 254. That's up over by Ote Mesa. Going down to the monument, 255, down by the pedestrian bridge and down by the port of entry by five. 256 is just to the south of, uh, south uh, west of the treatment plant. It's kind of hard. Can you see my cursor on here, my mouse? There's the treatment plant right in this area. So that's just up over here in the Spooner's Mesa and then down here, monument 258. Oh, and then of course you have the whole Tijuana River estuary all through here and up over here by Imperial Beach is the Navy Airfield. So a lot of the projects we did with the IBWC were all done when we were still the IBC, International Boundary Commission, back during the New Deal era. Now a lot of this, these projects that were done were basically in, is going through the Great Depression um, to get us out of that Roosevelt 
enacted a lot of different acts and one of them like Public Works Administration, um, National Industrial Recovery Act, Civilian Conservation Corps, all these different acts um, put together where funding was at to put people back to work. And a lot of our projects were all under the National Industrial Recovery Act of 1933. And they were all along the border in California, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas. And they were done with Mexico on a lot of these projects. Mexico paid for their own funding for projects, um, especially like over in Nogales, Arizona, the Nogales Wash. They did all of theirs. We did ours with the equipment of about 30, 40 people. And Mexico did theirs with about 300 people all by hand. So they put all those people to work. So why the projects because our treaties conventions and minutes all dictate that we need to be doing this stuff and that's what we work with and under the national industrial recovery act of 33 and public works administration is where we did this and basically also the laws and executive orders under fdr and without the funding we wouldn't have been able to do this because we had all these plans as you know in the government we have plans to do everything but we can't do anything unless you have funding so unless you have the funding to do it you can't do the work so put people to work and um, to get all this done. And a lot of them were done under the Aurora projects under um, the Obama administration. And as you can see on the bottom right picture, this is American Dam here in El Paso. So that basically with American Dam and American Canal and the border is just off to the right in the middle of the river, that was under the treaty, the 1906 treaty for water that put water over to American Canal for the American irrigators and the, west of, the rest of the water that went down went to the Mexican irrigators under the treaty. And then also I have our mission statement here of exactly what our mission is and what we do with the IBWC. So the National Industrial Recovery Act of 33, um, after FDR was elected, then he started getting all the different acts going to get people back to work. Um, in the Works Progress Administration. I put a lot of different things in here just for information to look at. But the ones that affect out there in California was the border monuments repair and repainting. Because remember, these were put in the 1890s and they need maintenance. And the Nogales and Tijuana sanitation and flood control projects. Um, a friend of mine, Kevin Malone, is finishing up his dissertation on the Tijuana area over at UCSD. So, the first one we're going to look at is the federal project number one. That's the resetting and repainting of the land monuments. Because you have to remember, um, the land monuments go from El Paso to the Pacific Ocean, Monument 258. But there are also monuments that go down the Rio Grande River on both sides of the river. But they're only about, they look like this monument, but they're only about a foot high. And they have a brass cap on top that says IBC and CDLA for CELA for the commission, for the Mexican commission. And they're on both sides of the river because if the river shifted, they can use trigonometry to re-figure out where the border actually still is and then try to get the river back into where the border was or just say, this is where the border is and then remark that. And we see a lot of these all along the um, border along the Rio Grande River. Also, as you can see here, what these guys did under the appropriation for this, which is part of another one, um, they paid these people to go out there in Model A's, Model T's, and they went from here in El Paso all the way for all the monuments. They did all of them, because this is before we had the, uh, minute, uh, the minute in, minute 244 in, and their job was to go all the way out there to each monument, fix them, and paint them, and they were paid $1,500 at that time frame. Of course, you gotta remember, you know, back during the Great Depression, that was a lot of money at that time frame. And a lot of our surveyors have said they've gone out there and they found the paint cans and other stuff just thrown around. So they didn't wanna take them down, they just threw them out there. So now I've got all these artifacts that hopefully in the future go out there and record them and collect them um, because people don't realize that's what they are. And another thing is how desolate these guys were out there is reading some of the stuff in the 1930s. They went out there in Arizona, their truck broke down. And so they gave the guy a gallon of water and they said, we'll stay out here until you go back to Tucson and get the park we need for the truck 
and then get back here. And they said, if you're not back in three days, we're going to start walking out ourselves because we'll be running out of water. But two days later, he came back on the third day and they, with the part they needed and somebody else that picked them up and drove them out there. But there were no roads or anything. So it's, it's interesting to read these stories of what was going on back in the early 1900s on fixing the monuments and doing the work out there. Now, also a New Deal project out there in California. As you know, we have the South Bay Water Treatment Plant that we have out there. And also during that time frame, as Tijuana was growing and the San Diego area was growing, uh, sanitation was be becoming a problem because you had open sewers that just dumped it into the river. And you would see that all along the rivers, even here in uh, El Paso, when they were putting in American Dam, they actually had the sewer lines just dumped straight out into the river. And that changed back in the 40s, 1950s, 60s of the sanitary sewer system. So what they did was they constructed a pipe and they had it buried and it basically went down under the river and out into the ocean and dumped the sewer a couple miles off there. And we still have, we still use that today, uh, but the water's treated first at the treatment plant. So under minute 320 from 2015, what this said is from the 1990s, we're gonna expand that to take care of more um, binational cooperation with Mexico for the people in that area for um, different trash problems and sediment and the treatment of that area. As you can see here in this photo, we've ex that's our treatment plant. We've expanded it even more. And on the left side, you can see that rock, that's the levee system. And that, that whole area between that and then the community off to the northern part or the west eastern part there, that is the other levee we have for the northern section. And the whole um, Tijuana River is off in the distance going down that area. So here's what it looks like with the South Bay Ocean outfall of what it was constructed and what it does with the treated sewage that comes out, goes down, and is released out in the ocean. If you've been out in that area, you know where Goat Canyon is, Smuggler's Gulch, and some of those areas out there. And uh, as you can see here, that's the look at the estuary off to the west. And we have these sediment collection basins that the water that comes down is collected and then um, it keeps it from digging into the river or uh, releasing more sediment than we want to have to go out in the ocean. So a lot of sites in this area, it's been heavily surveyed over the years, as you can see here. Um, up over here is Dairy Mark Road. And up over here is where we used to have our office out there, the IBWC office. Now we have it over down here in the treatment plant when we um, built, uh, expanded that, and we built a new office down there that's in the compound itself. And then, as you can see, all the different uh, sites in this area, in the estuary and up on Spooner's Mason in that, that location. So what have we been doing out there is when they first put the treatment plant in the early 1990s, uh, they had a survey out there. As you can see, lots of different prehistoric sites uh, to see what everything was looking like. Uh, basically, a lot of historic ranchos and prehistoric sites. And there's a big storm coming up because I can really hear it outside. So hopefully I won't lose communication here. But we have a lot of different sites in the Tijuana River Valley out there. And um, when I've been out there, I usually try to go out in the area back behind the treatment plant to see what's going on. And um, last time I was back there several years ago, I was checking that out because to see what was gonna be going on, if we we're gonna expand out there, which has been surveyed before and shovel tested, see what's, what it might be on surface, and if anything else is coming up because they've expanded that over time again. So when I was out there, as you can see, they were expanding the um, clarifiers on the treatment plant on, on our right, and that actually is on elevated ground. It's higher than the uh, surrounding land for the floodplain. And when I was out there, I was just looking around and found a lot of different uh, individual finds, artifacts in the surface. Now that area, just in the floodplain there, that's a little model airplane for uh, people to go out there and 
have their model airplanes and fly them out there. So that's what that is. So it's a um, fun little area. And then uh, Dairy Mark Road comes down to our left. So that's the size of the original um, site that was recorded at that time frame. It's a huge one that's out there. And I was just on a small section of it, as you, as you saw here. I was just over there, just looking at that area of what I recorded, of what I could find. And so this is what it was looking like at that time frame. That's looking to the southwest. And you can see the border wall on the hill. And that's the uh, San Diego treatment water purification plant we have over there. And we were just getting ready to expand our plant uh, in this location. So I'm out there and I was driving this little red car and that's a magnet for border patrol like you wouldn't believe because I was getting stopped until I said, tell everybody I'm driving this red car. I'm with IBWC. Please leave me alone so I can get my work done. And next time I go out, I'm not going to get a red car. I'm going to say, give me a blue one or something else. So I won't be stopped every half a mile. So this is what you're looking at. The flags were where we we're going to expand in that area, which we did. And just here's some of the stuff that I've seen out there. And um, our contractors, they've been seeing a lot of this out there too. Uh, the fine grain metavolcanic uh, green fell site all over that area. And the quarry area is off to the east in the mountains. And so just seeing some of that and out in that location, I found um, three primary flakes, two secondary and one um, fell site core. Now in the past, they've recorded a lot of IFs in these areas also. But the thing is on these is look how they're coming up. They were coming up from um, the animal burrows. So they were not too far below the surface and they were kicking them out in this area. And so at that time, um, I asked her to see if we could get some more testing. I don't know if anything was done, but um, they were going to be expanding the stuff, but not over in that area at that, at that time. So here's a close-up of what one of them looks like. Um, if you get out there, you're going to see a lot of these all over, a lot of this material. And uh, here's what it looks like in 2016 when we're expanding the, the plant. As you can see on the left side, this is being expanded over here. I was out over in this area checking this out, and then this is all pretty, still pristine, not used too much. But over the couple years, as you can see, what's been going on. This is their staging area they've been using for putting the new border wall in all along that area. And I haven't been out there since they've done that, but um, it's pretty much been leveled down and cleaned up, and they've been using that whole area. And then the future, we expect to have, uh, depending on, um, more minutes of what was going on, we might have to expand the, the plant again and go from there. So this is what you saw just a couple years ago. Now, one thing also when I was up there, I'm not sure if any of you knew about this, but there's uh, up on Spooner's Mesa there at the very western edge, uh, by Miami 257 up there, there's a fire control station that was associated uh, during World War II. And it's on this bunker complex that's up there. And from what I understand, they had a training ground that they would fire into the estuary down there. So if you're down there, you might find ammunition and stuff that was used by the Navy at this time for this project that they had up there. And um, there's no cover to them. So if you ever go up there, you can look straight on down to this bunker where they had uh, their weapons. And this is all World War II. And that's looking off the side where they've just uh, done some remediation work. Um, the border is actually to the, is that brown fence on the left side. That's actually where the U.S. border is at. And they put that secondary wall in in a road uh, some years ago. And so that's what it's looking like when you're up there. The border's off to our right, as you can see the fence. And there's the bunker complex that blends into that area. And this is a view to the northwest, as you can see our catchment basins we have down there that comes out of off Spooner's Mesa and also um, Smuggler's Gulch in that area to catch high water flows coming off from, uh, from Mexico. Because all that area, is, as you know, the Tijuana River flows north. So down here over by Monument 258, as you saw the previous pictures, they put that gate in. And then here's the newer one they just put in 
uh, about oh, less than 10 years ago. So when you go out there, you have to go through this one gate and you can make it over to the other one. And um, I haven't actually been able to get over to Monument 258. I have a little ID card that allows me to go across the border whenever and wherever I want to for official government work. So next time when I'm out there, I'll notify Border Patrol. I want to go through and look at Monument 258 and see what condition it's in. Even though it's Mexico it takes care of it, it's important for us to make sure that uh, uh, we can uh, analyze the monuments because they are both the U.S. and Mexico's property. So that's looking off towards the ocean at that time. Back at the new gate. And then the extension they had out into the ocean there. So this is a view southwest, as you can see, um, with the estuary in the top right, looking out over um, the ocean. Um, what were, or I'm sorry, over towards the Tijuana River Valley there. Um, the expansion of the wastewater treatment plants in the border wall will continue to expose a lot of more, a lot more prehistoric and historic history of the San Diego region, of what we had out there. Um, but as areas completely urbanized, except the mesas and floodplain and estuary, you're, you're not going to see uh, a lot of changes. But further work in the area because of what we had to do for the expansion of the levees will result in further testing and mitigation of what we just had recently done. So um, a couple of the people that are on here were the ones who were out there. And maybe there's some questions they might be able to answer them. They feel like it. But they were just out there to do a 10 acre survey of the Tijuana River area uh, for the North and South Levy project, as you saw in the pictures. Uh, this is completed and it's now over with the uh, Office of Historic Preservation California SHPO for review. Uh, it was pre prepared by GSRC and, and SWCA. They completed the field work this last year and I did the consultation with the Native American Heritage Commission and the Sacred Lands file. And I still have a few more stuff to do with that in the future. And they were out there during the nice part of the year in January to February. So where were they at? Well, they were down over here just to the north, as you can see by um, the star, the project location. And basically, I didn't put it in here, but they were looking at all this area through here and then down here to the bridge. Now, remember, um, Dairy Mark Road goes here, but the old Dairy Mark Road went over to this area, and then there was a bridge here, and then up over here are some other bridges. But it actually, another part came down through here, and then it crossed over into the, north, uh, the southern part up towards Mexico, uh, when you, you used to have a lot of different ranchos and stuff, and there was a one called Chicken Mark Road that was down there, because there was down over where the treatment plant is in the San Diego one, there used to be a chicken farm. So they had a, they called it chicken, uh, chicken mark road or chicken ranch road. So what did they do? Well, they did shovel testing out there because that's what I was calling for. And they had seven positive shovel test uh, locations and uh, one site, SWCA 1000 is a temporary site number. Um, as you know, the project was to, is for our rehabilitation of the existing levee system, the Tijuana River Valley, known collectively as the Tijuana River Flood Control Project. And that will consist from the concrete line portion over by the border with uh, Mexico, going downstream, and then coming out there. And so we have a flood situation in Mexico. All that water is coming down there. It will spread out into the Tijuana River Valley there where we have our, our levees where it's spread out so we don't have flooding in the surrounding um, area. Um, the channel boarding levees were constructed in 79 following um, another flood to contain that for a, a, to correspond to a 330 year flood occurrence. Here are some pictures they took. Um, as you can see, this is just off Dairy Mark Road. Uh, to the bridge over the Tijuana River. Uh, basically, the area on the bottom picture, that's a sod farm we have uh, leased out there for um, uh, a business. And uh, he's out there a lot for the sod farm. And uh, he knows that uh, they were going to be out there. They contacted him because they were going to be doing testing within that region. Um, I have a couple slides with a lot of stuff in here. 
So I'll let you zip through this kind of quickly and I'll just uh, abridge it as I'm going through. Um, in the synopsis they put together, basically, as you know, with the Tijuana area down there, Tijuana River area, um, the South Coast uh, Archaeological Region, eight arbitrary organized divisions in the state. Um, and they're all split up in the San Diego area, uh, Western Riverside. And then also, I, I, I skipped over all the prehistoric material in this area right now because I wanted to cover some of the stuff on the modern because this is what really is the impact we're seeing down there. And so in 1916, they had some major floods in that area. And that was realizing that were, there was gonna be problems out there. And then as you can see here in uh, January 18, 1916, a little bit north of the US-Mexico border, the little Landers colony, uh, the flooding uh, killed some people that were out there and overflowed into their homes and gardens and carried two of the women away who were who drowned. Um, by the 1960s, as the area is expanding, as you know, because of World War II, San Diego just grew exponentially. And then by, under the 1944 water treaty provisions, in the case of the Tijuana River, adequate flood control measures in Tijuana could not be implemented without the participation of the U.S. who will be receiving upstream waters. So that's why we had to take a, a role in this and construct our levees for flood control so we didn't have anything in Imperial Beach being flooded or the areas around there. The water can actually safely um, drain out into the Pacific Ocean. Um, City of San Diego requested money in the 60s. They passed it for the Tijuana Flood Control Project. Congress gave us money because we're dependent on them to get the money to get these projects done. Um, and then uh, the International Boundary and Water Commission formally approved the TFCP in 67 and in the valley of uh, that area. Meanwhile, uh, Mexico moved relatively quickly on its part uh, with theirs and they um, lined the Tijuana River in Mexico. And for, um, and then we had ours, so we also did some of that. Also, I don't know if any of you remember, I don't, but Hurricane Kathleen brought a huge amount of rain and winds over in that area. And also it, it flooded it again. And so we had a uh, major flooding in that area. So by 77, the Corps of Engineers redesigned the US part of the project for stilling basin configuration. The ones where you see the stilling basins along Goat Canyon out there. That's where we have that. And they do fill pretty fast. So every year we go out there and remove the sediment but they're, they're designed to do that so we don't have a whole area being inundated with silt and sediment like we have in the Rio Grande here in Texas where um, after a yearly we have to go out there and remove 20,000 cubic yards, 30,000 cubic yards or more of sediment from the dams so the water can flow freely again. So the stilling basins were put in, um, rechristened the Tijuana River Flood Control Project and uh, the channel uh, and levees were constructed pursuant to our jointly approved designs to con contain a, a large flood to come down the Tijuana River. And then in 93, another flood came through in that area, an existing channel under the Hollister Street Bridge. I didn't put a picture of the Hollister Street Bridge, but if you just go down Dairy Mark Road and continue down about oh, less than a mile, there's another bridge that heads north, and that's the Hollister Street Bridge and actually was replaced uh, some years ago uh, with a concrete one. As you see in 96, a new concrete pier, concrete deck structure over the new river channel. Um, and then Tijuana, San Diego established Tijuana River uh, Regional Park with an acquisition of 20 acres out there. Um, a lot of this, as you can figure out, is for to stop development out there or people selling the land out there for development because it's designed for flood control, like we have in our areas along the Rio Grande here. Um, if you go out there, you're going to be seeing a lot of estuary. Um, in the estuary, you can see a lot of equestrian horse farms or ho horse uh, parks. A lot of people out there that do live out there raise a lot of horse horses for uh, enjoyment. And so you see a lot of them out there. And as I was saying, the one part was we had a facility that was up at the end of Dairy Mark Road that we had up there uh, 
but uh, when we built the new treatment plant extension, we built a new office building there where our offices are at nowadays in a secured structure within the treatment plant um, confines. And as Sod Farm, they're still out there and still use that. So we're putting that to good use. And then they have the little uh, remote controlled airplane area for people to go out there from San Diego to um, fly their planes. And the thing is, as you can see the huge Sod Farm out here. And down here is the um, remote control planes. Our new office is right over here at the bottom of the screen. That's there. And here up on top, that's where our old office was located. It was a big trailer. Uh, we gave it to CBP and they used it for a while then tore it down. And we still maintain some of the land up here. But uh, the levee, as you can see, coming from the bottom, going all the way up here and over to this area, they're planning to expand it down here to the bridge or maybe go up this way and like that. They still haven't figured out what they want to do. It's engineers, so they're always des redesigning everything all the time. And I just get stuck with trying to figure out what they're doing. So what did they find out there? So Alex, who's on, on the, the speech here, um, he knows a lot of this, but they found a lot of debitage, a porcelain fragment, a glass fragment. Um, this is all coming in the shovel test. And the lithic materials you see here on the segment B of the project, or the area going down towards the bridge, a lot of these metavolcanic uh, tertiary flakes where the quarry uh, came from to the east in the mountains, off to the east there. And there's a uh, basalt flake also. So this is exactly the same stuff as I was showing that I found previously. And then here's what they look like on some of the stuff they were finding, as you can see here, on a couple of the flakes. And they did a really good job of uh, taking the pictures of this and identifying it. Uh, primary flake on the right side, and then also a couple greenish, uh, smaller flakes, all coming out in their um, shovel test. And then uh, another fine grain primary flake. And then the basalt flake. And then also they were finding, uh, they found a porcelain fragment and a marine shell fragment in that area. And so we know on the south side of the river, we, we believe there was a village out there that they had identified um, from previous archeological surveys before they put in the treatment plant and then off towards the east, but we haven't seen anything else uh, for shell coming up until what they found here. Here's a, another a glass bottle fragment from that and another uh, primary basalt on the right side. And um, I think I'm doing pretty good on time here. So I kind of hope you enjoyed just some of this stuff on uh, what I do, the IBWC, what we do in the Tijuana River Valley, what we've been finding, um, and the influence of the people that have been living down here, both prehistoric and historic, and um, how this area has just grown exponentially, but we have to restrict it within that area for flood control measures because our levees just go up to the bridge and on the south side, and the rest of it is open. That goes down to the, through the Tijuana River to the ocean and the estuary and then the state park. So we're still continuing to do work out there as we do more stuff, especially with what's been going on with the treatment plant and the sewage as you've been reading in the news out in that area, with our levee system, the South Bay International Wastewater Treatment Plant, and of course the border wall that they're redoing up on along the mesas in that area. So I just wanna say um, thanks a lot uh, to the IBWC for letting me talk about this and write about archeology span and history and geology. Uh, my boss who also helps me out on some of this. Steve Small, who retired a few years ago, he was our operations manager there at the um, old building in San Diego for the treatment plant. And uh, some of the different uh, sites I've used, also for GSRC and SWCA for letting me use the stuff and talk about the recent survey they just did. And also dedicate this uh, to my father and my grandfather, who my grandfather worked for the New Deal projects back in Nebraska. And as he said, he told um, my dad, uh, Roosevelt gave him a job and not just a paycheck, but his self-esteem. And I continue to do a lot of work on New Deal projects and write about them, especially on the Civilian Conservation Corps, and hope to get back to working on one on the Conservation Corps and um, the Forest Service in California. 
And uh, at that, I'll open it up for any questions you might have. And thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Mark. Yeah, that was really great. Thank you. Um, I do have we, I do have a couple of questions. Rachel wants to know that. Let's see, you mentioned two of those monuments had like time capsules underneath them, kind of way back up towards the beginning. And she was just curious if if there are more, if there are more kind of time capsules associated with any of the other monuments or just those two that you know of? Well, when we were doing the research on uh, 258, the time capsules, I believe there are two of them buried underneath that one. One from the original time from the 1850s and then another one when they went out there and redid the monument in the 1890s. So as you saw that brick, we believe there's two of them that are down there from according to the literature where we're reading. Not including what else you might find because the one here in um, El Paso, we believe there's something else that's also buried there. But of course, these aren't going to be moved. And let's say, you know, the, the monument gets knocked over or something, and then we'll have to redo that. Um, so as far as we know, there's there's probably two time capsules under Monument 258 that's inside that brick structure for the base of what it is. Um, an interesting thing is before the Gadsden Purchase, if you come up here to Las Cruces, New Mexico, to about 50 miles north, the original mine, uh, boundary went from the Gila River north and followed the Gila River through Arizona to New Mexico and ended um, at Las Cruces. When they put that monument in there, they used rock, local rock, but what they did also, and this is now on private land, so I can't go out there to go see it, but they had made mention they took a sarsaparilla bottle and they put a piece of the Washington Monument, the Washington Monument in Washington, D.C. They had a chunk they took off that and put it with a note in the sarsaparilla bottle to talk about this is the original, this is our starting point for the boundary survey back in the 1850s until the Gadsden Purchase when they moved it now, moved it south. Um, does that answer your question on that? Yeah, thank you. Um, we have another question. And I was curious about this too. Shannon wants to know if you have a counterpart archaeologist on the Mexican side that you work with, or if there's somebody on the Mexican side that also kind of does the same thing that you do. Then, and well, on the um, on the commission, we used to have Enrique who worked. Uh, okay, our commission, our counterparts are right across the river from us over in Ciudad Juarez, so they're actually five miles away or so as a crow flies and their office building actually is in the old um, customs and border patrol building because the Chamazal court actually moved the the boundary of the u.s north and then they cemented the river in back in the 1960s so they're actually in the old cb uh customs and border patrol building that used to be part of the u.s that's where our, um my counterpart Seedler are at Enrique, who was the ad hoc guy for them, he retired about four or five years ago. He used to be working with me on different aspects on history and archaeology and stuff. He retired, and as far as I know, we don't have anybody over there. So what I do is I work a lot with Ina on different aspects and the, some of the different archaeologists that um, are in the different regions. So I try to see what I can do with stuff with them. And I'm currently working with Emiliano Galago. Um, he's now down in Chiapas, but I'm working with him on some stuff down in the Presidio, Texas area, where we believe that's what the, some new documents we found, we believe the um, Mexican Revolution started earlier there in that region than down in Puebla, down in Mexico City. So we hope to have a publication out on that pretty soon. But uh, nope, unfortunately, um, I'm one for zero for for people, just me and nobody else over on the other side, unless I can get somebody from Ina. So I'm constantly trying to work with uh, people there who I can um, communicate with on special on projects, especially um, recently just found out that they found a Clovis site down at um, on the Mexican side on the Falcon Reservoir. And they showed me some pictures of these pristine Clovis points they were coming out. So hopefully I'll get down there to look at that and then work with somebody from Ina for that. 
Okay. Um, it looks like Shannon had a question that John answered in the chat over here about the depth depth of these of the site that that Swicka worked on. Um, basically, that it was buried. Shoot, we were we were thinking that that the sites are probably covered in a lot of alluvial sediment. And hey, Alex, did you want to answer that question since you did this? Alex, you want to chime, chime in on that one? Sure, I'd be glad to. Thanks, Mark. Um, sounds like John already uh, weighed in on the chat, but yeah, this um, the, the the very reason that uh, Mark astutely called for subsurface testing as part of a an inventory or survey in this region is is because it is a floodplain and there's a lot of movement of sediment and uh, a, a, a history of of uh, of finding buried archaeological deposits in that zone, uh, in that general area. And so um, that was absolutely the right call. We, we didn't find uh, a darn thing on the surface. Absolutely nothing. Uh, you can actually look at this picture behind me here. That's, this is from the project. And you can see that there's actually a metric ton of modern rubbish on the surface, but there were absolutely no um, cultural resources, anything over 50 years old that we could find on the surface. But once you start getting below the surface, then then the archaeology starts to reveal itself. So it's definitely uh, a, an area where the archaeology is out of sight and below ground. Thanks, Alex. Thanks. Uh, are there any other questions that anyone has? Any other questions? I've got, I sent you one. Where? Chris? In the chat? Through the chat. Jim, it got directed to me, Chris. <laughs> so you could just go ahead and yeah, ask because... it here. Go okay. ahead and ask, Jim. <laughs> Okay, um, now I've got to find it. <laughs> Read it, Chris. Um, it says, have the collections from the work in California been curated per 36 CFR 79? Alex, you want to answer that one? Yes, I'd be glad to answer that. Um, uh, our... Uh, Scope of work basically said that we were going to curate diagnostic artifacts that were found. Any any such artifacts um, that might you know be temporally diagnostic or give us a sense of chronology. Um, and really, all we found w were the things that Mark showed you pictures of some some unworked uh, flakes that you know are not tools. They're not didn't appear to be utilized flakes or anything like that. We had the one uh, bottle base fragment. And so we did not deem any of these artifacts to be diagnostic and worthy of taking up space at the uh, ARC Center. So we went ahead and dropped them back in the holes and reburied them. So no, we are not um, curating any of those artifacts that uh, were identified in the shovel test from this particular project. Great question, though. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, the thing is, when I wrote the contract, is this diagnostics? Because otherwise, as you said, you know, a lot of places would be, there's not much information you can get from anything but, a, you know, a diagnostic. And out in that area, all the areas I've been seeing as I showed on my photos, the same things they were finding is what I was finding in the south side. I haven't seen anything else. And what we did find is um, if we're doing major project work, then we'll have more, more testing being done and probably excavation. But the whole point on this one was to see in this area that hasn't been looked at before, what is there? And they found the site. And originally when I did my contract, I think I said, what, Alex, 30 for a site or was it 15? And then you guys said uh, for the South Bay area, it's, it's six of what they're looking at for a standard in that area, if I'm correct. 
because it varies from different areas. Yeah, I'd have to double check, but I want to say it's three. Three, okay. It, it, it varies because you have to remember, um, when I was putting this out, I was using the scope of work for what I thought would be the best one for that area, for, you know, a site, but then they helped me out and said, no, this is what it is. And so we went with, you know, recommendation for the San Diego area because I've worked all over, like up in, I worked all the way in the northeastern section of the state of California, up in the Modoc County, where you find a site everywhere because it's it's 44 different sources of obsidian on that forest, and so everywhere you go, you're going to find obsidian uh, shatter. So they actually had a PA with uh, with Shippo for a site that consisted of 30 flakes within um, a 30 meter uh, area because there was so much you were going to find. So that that was changed. So here it's a lot different. But the one thing that is, you can see what Alex, what they found in there and, and what I found is we're finding some stuff on surface, but as you saw in the ones I had, they were coming out of the rodent holes. And when Alex and, and David and those guys were out there, same thing, they found it only in their shovel tests. So we're seeing a lot of subsurface stuff, but nothing on the surface. And I think a lot of it that's not on the surface is because of collectors, people walking by in these areas, picking things up over time. Another point I'll just make real quick is that, you know, this, this buried site that we found, it really looks like uh, a secondary deposit, um, probably related to a flood event where these tiny little flakes are getting washed down the river with sediments and, and flood waters. And so I'm not convinced that this zone that we found where we had our positive tests is is really like a primary locus of prehistoric activity but rather a place where detritus and you know lithic flotsam if you will is coming from upstream and collecting against the levee okay Last call for questions. If everybody is done with questions, then we can go ahead and wrap up. I don't see any more questions. Um, okay, that'll do it for us. And thanks a lot, Mark. We really appreciate your time and putting that together for us. It was really very interesting. Yeah, I, I just, thanks, Mark. Okay, I just wanna say when I'm out there again, um, since I have some access, when I get out there, I'll, I'll send an, an email out to you to see if uh, I give you a little tour of that area. That's usually That'd be kind awesome. of uh, yeah. It's I can get us through the gate, so that's a nice thing of uh, being out there, so we can go see some of the different areas because it's so uh, restricted anymore. They basically you have to stay on Dairy Mark Road, and then if the area is not underwater to get to the Borderfield State Park you know, you can't get access to it. And so um, hopefully when I get out there again, I'll put something out to say, hey, maybe, you know, have a little tour in that area.